Hey everybody, it's Matt. I hope things are going awesome in your world. Thanks for hanging out with me on my YouTube channel, where in this video, brass tacks, let's just say it how it is, we're about to go and check out a church that is way different from the tradition that I was raised around, from the tradition that I'm a part of now. I suppose those traditions that I've been around would be more on the conservative side of the Christian family tree. The church we're about to go and check out is decidedly on the old school liberal side of the Christian family tree. So I'm an outsider here, and they knew I was an outsider when I asked to come and check out their very unique-looking church, very uniquely historically situated church, and they were kind enough to open the doors to me anyway. My goal when I go and visit somebody else's church as a guest is not to go in there guns ablaze and see if I can fix all of their points of imagined wrongness, but look, I mean, I have points of disagreement with this church, and some of them are pretty substantive, and they have points of disagreement with me, and yet I mean, we put together a really nice conversation. That is the gentleman I'm about to introduce you to and myself, and I really enjoyed my time at this particular church. The name of the church is St. Mark's Episcopal. It's in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm going to introduce you to a gentleman named Reverend Mark. That's right, it's Reverend Mark at St. Mark's. He was the rector, the pastor of this church when I recorded the video. Since then, congratulations to him. He's gone on to retirement. But one of the things you're going to notice about Reverend Mark. He's super sharp and incredibly knowledgeable about the church he was pastoring. He knows who built it. He knows why they built it the way they built it. He knows what they were trying to communicate. He understands the dance steps and controversies from the better part of a century ago that immediately surfaced about this design choice and that design choice. He's very knowledgeable in terms of the artists and poets, painters, sculptors, all the people who made contributions to what this church is, and he's proud of his church. And I really respect that, and I really respect him taking the chance on letting an outsider who he knows he doesn't see eye to eye on about everything. I really, really respect his willingness to take a chance on letting me come and visit and to letting me come with a camera so that I can invite you as well. So with that said, here we are in St. Louis, Missouri at St. Mark's Episcopal Church. Let's go and meet Reverend Mark and see if we can get a sense of this local congregation and a better sense of the Episcopal tradition in general. Let's start with the obvious question. Okay. This is an Episcopal church. Yes. What is Episcopal? Episcopal means it's a, that we are a church governed by bishops, bishops that can trace their uh, ordinations back uh, through the apostolic succession. Okay, The Episcopal Church in the United States um, is an international church, but mostly in the United States, but in some other places, and we're part of the worldwide Anglican uh, communion. So we're part of what uh, was originally the Church of England and then became all these provinces around the world. Okay. Yeah. I've never seen, this isn't a facade, this is the actual church building I'm looking at, right? right? Yeah, I've never seen a front of a church that looks like this ever. Where does this fit in the history of architecture? What does it mean? Why does it look like this? Well, um, as you can see from the uh, engraving, this was uh, built in 1938. And so- <laughs> You're acting like I can decode that. Yeah, 1938, yeah, I totally yeah, know. 1938, we'll and so um, that is uh, smack in the middle of the Art Deco movement. And so St. Mark's was designed by architects that um, were celebrating the modernist movement because Art Deco was considered modernist. And arguably, we're the first modernist church west of the Mississippi, uh, certainly oh. in the St. Louis area. Area. It's reminiscent uh, more of an Egyptian temple rather than the usual neo-Gothic thing that you see for most Episcopal churches. Now that you mention it, your churches generally look like how little baby me would draw a castle while I was spacing oh, off yeah, in school. Oh yeah, the whole, the whole neo-Gothic movement. Yeah, with everything. big yeah. stones yeah. and mm -hmm. it looks like, you know, parapets and the steeples yeah. sort there, of... There's, there's a lot of those. Look like a fort, which... <laughs> and, and this is just so very, very different. I'm struck right off the bat by the asymmetry of the front. Mm -hmm. We have who I assume to be St. Mark. Yes. And then nobody. What right. was the thinking in it's, putting him here instead of in the middle or adding somebody else over here? Um, I, I think it was a, an architectural and artistic um, decision. It draws attention to the sculpture. It's a very comforting and welcoming representation of St. Mark. He's holding scripture and he's standing on a lion and the lion is the symbol for St. Mark. Yeah, and he looks like the, the characters that I think of as being like on 30 Rockefeller Place that 
Uh, oh, sure, sure. 1930s, yeah. it mm -hmm. still looks like Greek sculpture in that the mm -hmm. proportions, the big hands, the tall, right. robust body, but also kind of squared off and with more yeah. modernistic lines. Yeah. I've never the, seen the, that take on Mark before. They're, they're all of that error. Okay, I want to go inside. I'm champing at the bit to see what's in here, but I have one more question about sure. the front. These crosses on the door, on the handles, they've got like a uh, tail or something. I'm not sure I've seen that before. Okay. What does this mean? Th those are chi rows. Perhaps you know that uh, the chi and the row are symbol for, for Jesus, for Christ, because it's, the, it's how you spell his name in shorthand in Greek. Sure, yeah, the chi two row. Greek symbols that you right. see that kind of, they overlap. Mm -hmm. And that's what those are. Of course, a stylistic representation. Right from the get-go, you're going into Christ's place. Okay, well, let's do so. Okay. So this is the narthex, all right, and um, or otherwise known as a vestibule. <laughs> in, okay, in, is there a difference between persons. the two? There is not. It's just that um, in the Anglican Church and in the Episcopal Church, we like to have um, old names for things and make it difficult for people to understand when they first come. So, um, so this is a this is called a narthex, but it's the vestibule, and this leads us into the church. Is there a design reason that we go upstairs? That um, I think the design reason is because we're going into praise. That really does communicate something. I mean, you're coming up the mm -hmm. stairs toward the altar and toward the sanctuary. At sure. eye level here, I'm greeted by these messages. That sure. sets a tone. And, and the other thing is, is, is from an architectural standpoint, because the, the building was designed by a pretty famous architect in this area. And, um, and so you can almost get the whole Frank Lloyd Wright thing where you enter into a smaller, more confined space and then you come through these doors and then you'll see what's on the other side. So it's like a palate cleanser from whatever was yeah. out there yeah. before I get the actual main course. Yeah. Eucharistic pumps inside. I like that. Inside. Yeah. Okay. I like that. Palate right. cleanser. Yeah. <laughs> I have never seen a church like this in my entire life. Neither had I until I came to interview. First of all, it's stark, but also beautiful. It feels like, it feels like a church would look like in Metropolis, that mm -hmm. sort of early 20th century. Precisely. Though so at the time, that style was this, the Metropolis style, if you will, or um, the Egyptian style because oh. Egypt was a very big thing in the Art Deco period. Um, the Tutankhamun's tomb had recently been found. Okay. And so if you, when you enter this, and even as you saw on the outside, it looks like an Egyptian temple as opposed to a neo-Gothic Anglican Episcopal church. I've never made the connection ever that this style of art has that Egyptian influence, but mm -hmm. as soon as you said it, mm -hmm. I thought, well, well, yeah, come to think of it, yeah. I, I mean, all of this, early 20th century modern architecture, like in skyscrapers and things like that, mm -hmm. all seems to have that sort of Luxor motif going a sure, little bit. Sure, sure. Clean lines, uh, yeah. you know, geometry. Tall lines. What do, you, what do we call this stuff up along the top here? It's crown, crown molding. molding. Thank you. Even that, I mean, it looks like an Egyptian temple, something you would see in the desert. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I got a question about that. Okay. With, with the Tutankhamun thing and the Egyptian thing accidentally overlapping, is there some intentionality in sort of co-opting some of that Egyptian imagery of the exaltation of false gods for the exaltation of the true God? Or is it just a stylistic happenstance that that's when the, this was in fashion? I would suppose we'd have to ask the architect and he's dead. <laughs> but I mean, if you want to um, lay that over okay. on it, you certainly can. I'm gonna go ahead and do I, that. I hadn't thought of that before, but sure. Okay, can I ask about the stained glass? Sure. Oh, wait, I need to know what this is first. Okay, well, this is the baptismal font. This is the new font. Um, this one here was the original font that was here for uh, the longest time. However, it's kind of dangerous and it's top heavy and twice people ran into it and toppled it over. And we had it repaired, but then um, one of our members uh, whose wife died, he wanted a, a memorial for her and he uh, had this commissioned. Um, and, uh, and so that's the font we use now. As you can see, um, he's, he's, he was a 50-year organist here, and he was very into St. Mark's. Um, and so he actually had the design mimic some of the design that's throughout the building. Oh, you're pointing to the 
the, the balustrades and so forth. Yes. There it is. Yeah. He designed this with the marble cutter and um, you know, mimicked some of the fittings and so forth that you see throughout also. I sense there's a theological reason that is different for why the impulse here would be to say, hey, if we can salvage that old baptistry from a church that burned, we better do it, or in this case, font. Mm -hmm. Whereas at a Baptist church, like, I don't know, we can just throw that away and get a new one. Yeah, well, I think, I think for, the, for the Anglican communion and for Episcopalians, you know, we, we are very focused on our history as we live in the present and move forward into the future. But we, we value our history and all the saints that came before us and, and all the people who prayed in this space before us. And so it's not unusual that if something were to survive that and it was being brought together to start something new, that uh, it would be saved. When you were talking about the Egyptian motifs before, I was facing that way. Since we've turned around, mm -hmm. and this looks like, like a mid-century movie theater. Mm -hmm. like I feel like I've seen these kind of pillars, sure. like with the lights going up, and yep. I can picture a dirigible or like an airship in the <laughs> background with some marquee messaging yep. on it, and ladies with like the flowy gold hats and stuff walking through doors that look like this. Well, sure. I mean, it was 1938, so it's at the height of that period. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got to ask about the stained glass. I don't want to forget about this. Okay. Is that like a zombie death white thing that's in the middle of that window back there? That uh, round window represents the massacre of the Holy Innocents. Oh. Okay, but, but not the whole window, just that central portion, because in all of the accompanying portions are representations of Jesus overcoming disaster and, and so forth. And that, of course, was a nod to the, the Church of the Holy Innocents, which was one of the churches that came together for St. Oh. Mark's. Holy Innocents, that you know, if you see that on a church or a building in you know, Catholicism, Anglicanism, anything, we're talking about the babies that Herod had killed. <laughs> right. I would have needed to stare at that for a long time. All right, you've decoded it for me. What about, what about everything else? Is there a, okay. a cohesive story through these? Or are they all one individual separate no, element? No, there is a cohesive story. Actually, these windows um, were rather controversial when they were installed. But if we start, what we see is that at the top of the windows, they mirror each other. You have a representation of Christ holding a lamb, Christ the Good Shepherd on both sides. On this side, what we have are representations from the Gospel of Mark that uh, refer to the incident when Jesus is arrested. When we hear that there is a young man there who is draped in a cloak, he gets very scared when the soldiers come to arrest Jesus and he runs off and leaves the cloak, so he runs off naked. And Echoing Joseph from the Old Testament. Right, but, but, but the thing is, is, is that um, some conjecture is that that person was Saint Mark. On this side, though, we have scenes that reflect more about what was contemporary at the time. Like labor issues. Okay, so those um, there are the two architects that uh, worked on the building, okay? Because those are legit overalls in a stained glass window. Yes. And I've never seen that before. Right, and so you have one person with the hammer and one person holding a nail. The top one is a representation of Frederick Dunn, who was the main architect, and his partner, Nagel, whose first name escapes me now. When you notice that they were laborers, it's, it's an important thing because at the time, um, there was large labor movements, mm -hmm. as, as you know, and um, St. Mark's was always part of that from its inception. And if you see on the very bottom, you see the figures, they're not doing a tug of war, they're cooperating because there was a movement called the cooperative movement sure. that was going on. And their symbol are those two trees that you see in that tiny little circle. Okay. So this was, this was wow. an homage to the architects, but also to labor. Like I could see, like now looking back, that's a time capsule. I get it. Christ is still over it. But I could imagine how people in that era would look at it and say, oh, it's too much. You've gone too far. Was that the concern or was it well, this just one political wasn't the, disagreement? This one wasn't really one of the most controversial ones. Oh, so I'm the one getting bent out of shape about it. Yeah. Everybody else was fine. We move forward. <laughs> okay. okay. So on this side, we see the uh, young person in his cloak being accosted by a soldier. Obviously, you can see the fear on his face. The Christ in this representation is Christ the prophet. 
Mm -hmm. Obviously, they're having conflict here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this one's also about conflict. This is the, the conflict between black and white, king and peasant, capitalist and laborer. Oh, how interesting. Okay. However, as you can see, that vine that travels up, all of this stuff is, is going to be taken care of by Christ, or Christ is, is doing something about it, or will do something about it. He's holding the Greek for logos, so that's the word. And it's not surprising to have a devil up there, because who's instigating it? Yes. Yeah, so these are the conflict windows, right? Didn't come to bring peace, but to bring a sword. So in other words, there's a reassurance here that that conflict should not cause one to falter and say, well, there can't be a God, there's conflict. Right. No, no, the conflict was And, and that Christ promised. is the prophet mm -hmm. of all prophets. Mm -hmm. you know. And that he stands above what seems like the biggest conflicts of our moment, mm. you know, with the authority, the sword, to bring justice and to resolve it. Yeah, this it's powerful. Yeah. There's so much more there than I caught at first glance. All right, so we have the initial window, we have the conflict windows. What's going on in this okay, third set? Okay, so um, in this, this is Mark running away naked. <laughs> they went real easy on the naked. Yes, of course. Okay, that's good. Of course, yeah. Oh, what's Jesus holding here? It's, it's, uh, it's a representation of a wheat staff, but it's, it's a representation of a scepter from when the crown of thorns was placed on him and so forth. So these two windows are uh, Christ the man of sorrows. Not and this was the one that caused the most commotion. In fact, someone, um, and I don't know if, the, if this is uh, apocryphal or not, but someone supposedly said that they were going to help fund these windows and pulled out um, when they saw the plans for this one. Hmm. So, what do you see? I see people marching off to war. Mm -hmm. They're World War I soldiers. Okay, so it looks like we're maybe blaming World War I and the destruction of nature on greed, kings, well, yeah, modern yeah. power we weren't prepared to wield. We are looking at what happens when humankind turns away from Christ, from the Savior, the man of sorrows, and believes through their hubris that they can control things. And so what comes out of that is death, destruction. Um, you can see the greed, the money bag. You can see the skulls, the crossbones, the bombs, and so forth. The towers that smack of the lessons of the Tower of Babel. Yeah. They look like modern skyscrapers. And interestingly enough, those World War I soldiers, because it was 1938, so World War II hadn't fully happened yet, um, but those soldiers, they have little Hitler mustaches. I was gonna let you be the one to point that out because <laughs> you don't wanna be wrong on the Hitler mustache. Yeah. So we're in the late 1930s here. Yeah, so Hitler's already in power in Germany, but, but we're not War, exchanging bullets with him World yet. World War II has not, you know, it doesn't commence until 1939. Right, so he's into in Sudetenland, he's gobbling up mm -hmm. territory unchecked at this point. Right. Yeah, that is bold. Right, and, and, the, and, and I don't want us to sound too morbid or or pessimistic or anything like that, because if we move to the, the final windows, Correct. Um, that optimism um, is restored. Yes. Yeah. That optimism is restored. So in this window, you have Christ the victor, okay? He has a scepter. He's holding the world. All of the Eucharistic symbols are throughout the window. Hmm. The only time a woman is represented in the windows is this man and this woman together. They are cloaked in eternity, and all fruition has come through Christ. Here's what happens when we allow Christ to do what Christ needs to do. And so they're, they're very similar there, except, of course, we have the representation of, of St. Mark the Lion. Oh, so even Mark from his shame to triumph yeah. in the role that he played. Yeah. Okay, well then this is what I'm seeing. The architects serve as a motif for creation, the foundation, the beginning of things. Yep. Here we have the roots of conflict. Here we have the explosion of conflict and human evil. And in the moment that would seem to promote the greatest despair, through the body and blood, through the work of Christ, the establishment of the, the kingdom is realized, justice is realized, and the goodness of the king is realized as he reigns visibly supreme 
over his creation that he put together in the beginning, yeah. knowing that that conflict would happen, knowing that the ugliness would happen, but still glorified through the process. Wow. Sometimes you gotta go through crap to get to the end goal, right? That's been my experience. <laughs> yeah. That might be the most complex walkthrough of stained glass windows that I've ever experienced. Oh, okay. So I thought the zombie one would be the one that would get my attention the most. But <laughs> can we talk about what happens up here? Sure. So this, this is, of course, the altar. It used to be against the wall when services were done with the priest east facing. Most Episcopal churches, where they can be, are oriented so that the altar is at the east um, and that people are praising to the rising sun. Anyway, so this is um, where uh, the magic happens. Okay. Um, yeah, so every Sunday we gather for prayers, to hear the word, to sing hymns, and then to share in Eucharist. If you come here... Am I allowed to come around back here with you? Of course you are. All right. Um, so typically we would have um, a chalice with some wine in it and, and, and patens or plates with uh, hosts on it and it would be on that table there. And then um, there would be an offertory hymn, so people would be singing an offertory hymn and then once that's over, then um, I would invite everybody to stand and start the Eucharistic prayer. What we're doing is, is we're, we're gathering to hear um, what transpired in history about this and, um, and we're here to uh, uh, bless and to break. So to bless the bread and break the bread and to share it. Here's one thing I notice. If like, this space back here, you said that this used to be against the wall. This, yes. The altar used to be against the wall. So mm -hmm. that means that you used to do all of this part of the liturgy with your back to the congregation? I never have, no. That was the, 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 the uh, change, the liturgical change in moving the altar away from the wall and, and having the priest do east-facing facing communion prayers, which means that the back is to uh, okay. the, the congregation. That, that started to change in the late 60s and through the 70s. And there was a big hoo-ha about that too, you know. All right. Uh, you know, but, but I, that was before me. But there's a theological reason for the east facing that the people who are proponents of it will say, and that is that the priest is just like the congregants. So the priest is, is doing everything on behalf of the congregants, but is one of the congregants too. Got it. Okay. And then when you turn and you're facing them, I, I think one of the challenges of that for some, um, not necessarily in the congregation, but for some of the priests, is whether or not they uh, feel like they have to perform. I mean, it's all performative in some way, okay? Doing, doing all of this, as you know, is, yeah, is perform performative in, in some way. But, um, you know, it's, it's people being overly conscious of what, what, how they're moving and what they're saying and, and being a little bit more dramatic about it, mm -hmm. um, which I don't think is what I'm called to do. I'm, I'm called to offer these prayers on behalf of everybody, and so that's what I try to do. So I see these, these candle posts, I mean candle sticks is an understatement. I assume these are lit during church? They are um, during the service. These are called the pavement uh, candles. Are they evocative of something from like the Old Testament temple? Well, you know, there's always, there's always a lot of, 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 of mythology or accretion that happens to why we have things. You know, so why are there candles on the altar? Well, you ask 10 Episcopalians and you're probably gonna get at least eight different answers, okay? okay? Oh, that's because it's the light of Christ, or that's because of this, or that's because of that. Well, no, there's candles on the altar, so there's light and we can see. And that's what they were there for in the beginning. Okay. But, but we start, because of the importance of what we're doing, then people start applying to these things um, something deeper meaning, mm -hmm. okay? so. Um, yeah, I think I, I love these pavement candles because they help balance the space. You mean just stylistically? Yeah. Like the feng shui yeah. works. I, but they've always been here. But when I came in, it was like, oh, those are cool. Because in, in a lot of churches, what will happen is you will have, you will have candles that are in floor stands uh, at the front of the altar. And then you have the candles on the altar. In some churches, you have um, rarados, which is like a shelf behind the altar. And there's like 
candelabras all along. Oh. Okay, it's been more of a minimalistic mm -hmm. um, approach here, which I'm happy with. Before I ask you about what goes on over here with the lectern or the pulpit, I have a question about this piece of art here. This is a very different depiction of Jesus than I've ever seen before. What does this mean? Well, this, um, you, you may have heard of the term Christus Rex, uh, Christ the King, and this is Christ victorious. Rather than showing Jesus in pain and all disfigured on a crucifix, this is a representation of Christ upon the resurrection. So this has become a, a pretty prevalent symbol in a lot of churches that aren't focused on the, the crucifixion so much as, as being Easter people. And, um, and so mm. this was sculpted by Sheila Burlingame, the same artist who did the sculpture of St. Mark on the front of the church. Huh. And then the, the rug over on that side was woven in 1940, and it was a plea for racial coming together. And it was a little controversial because you know it was it was talking about how you know all the races need to come together and but um, it's funny how not controversial it seems now. Right, right, and that's a good thing. Like obviously, that's, that's a blessed <laughs> thing. Is, oh, yes. and and that's the front of the church. Yes, picked it on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, okay. the woman who wove it was a member. Okay. Yeah, and the Egyptian motif here. Mm -hmm. We talked about that as an artistic flair in keeping with the style, mm -hmm. but it seems like if you're talking about justice and slavery and coming out of slavery that Egyptian imagery might also point sure. to Exodus oh, sure. Sure. as well. It definitely does. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and so you wanted to, so, well, yeah. so there's actually, this is the lectern. This is where the readings are read on Sundays and uh, the prayers of the people are said. And this, uh, on the other side, is the pulpit. Oh, they're not the same. They're not the same. Um, I'm sorry the piano's in the way, it got moved because of COVID, we needed to open up that space in the back. Okay. Um, but you can see that there is a representation of a lion, so St. Mark. And then there's a whole host of other symbolism that takes place. The artist who made these in the 50s, okay, so they weren't here originally, is the same artist who, I don't know if you're familiar with the famous uh, uh, sculptures, wire sculptures in Coventry Cathedral in, in London. Mm -hmm. That was the cathedral that was bombed severely during the Second World War, and they made the decision to leave it the way it was, oh, and then okay. just build around it and everything. I've and seen so that. He, did, he did the very famous sculpture there um, um, in Coventry Cathedral. And over here you can see there's a whole lot of, uh, of Christian symbols. There's a Star of David, there's candles, there's fish, of course, which was the, the symbol of Christianity for a long time, and Eucharistic grapes and, and so forth. Tell me again, what do you do with the one that you don't do with the that, other? That's the pulpit, so that's, that's where I preach from. So the homily happens there? Mm. And, 10 and minutes, 12 minutes? Is it yeah, pretty succinct? Yeah, yeah. I, I try to keep it 8 to 10. Um, and uh, a, a long one for me would be 12 if I need, to, if I need that space. Um, yeah, that's, I think that I should be able to say what needs to be said in that amount of time. You manuscript that out and read it? I do, I do. Um, so you really have, a, I mean, it's tight. You know the time that you're gonna hit. Yeah, and, and I do that primarily, um, the, the training that I went through. Uh, there, there's a, a number of people who can preach extemporaneously, fabulously, and that's great. Um, I've never felt comfortable doing it, but what, the, the main reason why I do what I do is because when people come up afterwards and say, why did you say blah, blah, blah? And I say, um, you know what? I don't think I said blah, blah, blah. I think I said this. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, and that happens more often than you think. And mm. not that people are feeling bad or, or you know, they're, they're upset about something, but just that you, you, know, you said this, and I, and I want to be clear that, no, that's not what I said, but mm. you heard that, so let's talk about that. Ah, uh, so, oh, okay. So it's not so much about covering your butt no. as much as it is about, well, this sets you up to minister to the soul of that person that much it, better. It's a both and. Okay. It's a both and. Covering the butt and, you know, let's be able to have a discussion about it. I think it's a valid both and. Yeah. 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 So that's the preaching side. Yes. This is reading from the, do the we call it a lectionary? Or? Yes, we have a lectionary that we okay. follow. So we have set readings. We don't choose our own. Uh, you, there is some choice in the, in the common lectionary, as you're probably aware. But, um, 
but basically, you know, they're, they're the readings assigned for that liturgical Sunday. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That was a pretty abrupt cut. I know it's sort of weird to be back here at the desk, but I've got to cut it right there because this is going to have to be two videos. Right after what you just saw, the conversation totally shifted and not in a bad way, just in a deeper water way. I, maybe we both intuitively felt like we had our conversational footing with each other. And so normally at this point, I would go and we'd sit down, we'd set up some lights and try to make it look like a very serious, very important interview. We sit down in chairs and that's great. I like doing that and then presenting that as a second video. But here we just got into it, just standing right there. And Nate, my buddy who films these things, he, his shoulders and his back were aching, but I'm like, keep filming, man. This is a great conversation. Some of it's tense. Some of it is playful. All of it, though, I think is really profitable and useful. So I'm going to share pretty much all of that conversation with you in the next video. And I think you're going to find it fascinating. And I, I mean, if you're still here and you enjoyed what you saw so far, I think you're really going to like what happens in that next video. And after we've done that, I'll share some of my observations and reflections. I've had time to think about this visit and this conversation, and I look forward to uh, processing all of that with you when everything's done as well. So please hang around for the next video. That'll be out as I'm recording this. It'll be out you know, in just a few days. You won't have to wait too long after this one to get it. These kind of videos can happen because some of you weirdly decided that you wanted to support this YouTube channel at patreon.com slash tmbh. You don't have to do that, but thank you. It costs money to travel around and do things like this or to really to do any of this stuff on this channel. And I, I really enjoy doing it. Uh, thank you to those of you who find it to be fruitful, especially fruitful to the degree that you'd want to kick in. It's not weird if you don't want to do that, but a huge thank you to those of you who have. All right, more of this conversation with Reverend Mark next time around, and obviously a huge thank you to him and to St. Mark's Episcopal in St. Louis for opening their doors to really truly an outsider to them and extending me the trust to even have a conversation like this. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next time around. All right, I'm Matt. Thanks for hanging out with me on my YouTube channel. Let's do this again soon.